Hi everyone! Welcome to Maybe TV Asks Episode 3, an interview with Lisa Diamond. I'm very excited to say that I interviewed Lisa Diamond, Professor of Developmental Psychology, Health Psychology, and Gender Studies. I asked them 14 questions and got a very, very good scope and very good understanding of gender. And I hope that you get the same. Now, let's not wait anymore. I'll play the interview. Hi. Hi there. Is gender and sex the same thing? No. And in fact, there's an increasing consensus that nobody really knows what exactly uh, we mean by biological sex. Um, there was a time where um, psychologists and biologists used to think of sex as being the sex of one's body and gender being your gender identity. Um, but that neat and tidy distinction doesn't even fully capture how much variation there is because biological sex is not a single thing. There are actually um, five different biological kind of components of sexual differentiation. Uh, you know, genes, prenatal hormones, internal genitalia, external genitalia, secondary sexual characteristics. And they don't always correspond. And so it's actually not even sort of correct to ask someone like, what's your biological sex? It would be more accurate to say, what are your biological sexes? And the, we make a gender assignment based on one and, and only one of those, which is the appearance of external genitalia in the infant. That is just one of the five. The others are invisible to us. So we take that one marker and we kind of project onto it a whole bunch of other things. In most cases, the appearance of the external genitalia lines up reasonably well with the other forms of sexual differentiation. But each one of them has their own continua and their own range of variation. And so, uh, biological sex is just as complicated and just as variable as gender um and so gender is basically everything else and everything that we experience as our own gender um is filtered through our sensory experiences of the world our perceptions of the world our understanding of the world how people treat us we know that people even hold babies differently if they think they're girl babies versus boy babies that is another contribution to the child's developing sense of gender so gender is complex and differentiated on every possible level and you know i personally um you know my, my personal view is that we should just get rid of the term sex altogether and simply talk about all of the various things that feed into gender. Some of them happen to be biological, but that the notion that there is a distinct sex that is dis that is uh, separatable from gender is does not appear to be scientifically true. How does someone's sexuality develop? Talk about a six million dollar question, how does sexuality develop? You know, um, what we know about sexual development is hugely biased by the fact that particularly in the United States, we're not really allowed to ask children about sex. We're not allowed to ask them about sexual desire. There are pretty strict so that make it very, very difficult to ask young children about any aspect of their erotic sensibility. So that means that all we know about sexual development uh, is either behavioral, like what kids of different ages are doing, and then adolescents or adults' recollections 
of what they experienced in the past. And those recollections are not, you know, they're, they mean something, but they don't mean anything. I mean, they don't mean everything. And so we don't have a very good idea of how sexuality develops. We know that children are sexual. Uh, there are studies showing that infants will touch their own genitals, you know, in the womb. So the idea that children aren't sexual and that sexuality just kind of emerges in adolescence is wrong. Sexuality is a part of every stage of life and it is a very dynamic system. It evolves and flows and changes. And so again, the sort of old uh, notion that um, everything about your sexuality is sort of fixed at birth and then it's just a matter of when it emerges. That's not quite true either because sexuality is a dynamical system and it develops in interaction with other people and with our environment. How does someone's identity develop? Ident we know a lot more about identity development because that is a process that does typically begin in adolescence and it's typically linked to maturation of the brain in the way that that at a certain age you are able to really start to think of yourself and reflect on yourself and ask yourself kind of who you are and what you want as an individual and that is something that that um, touches many areas of life and not just sexuality so with regard to sexual identity and gender identity there's, you know, a certain sort of point in time at which your brain is developed enough for you to say, who am I, what am I like relative to what I see around me and what I experience around me? Am I same or am I different? Um, am I acting like this person? Am I not? And because humans are a social species, because we depend so heavily on social interactions, our first sort of sense of our identity comes from comparing ourselves to others, which is why, you know, in studies of sexual and gender identity development, uh, often the very first glimmers of that process involve individuals saying, okay, if I am a this, what do those people seem like? Do I, do I seem to be like them? Do I seem to be different from them? So in many ways, it's the process of sort of evaluating how you think and perceive yourself relative to how you perceive other people and and whether you feel that they match you or don't match you and what is your category what is your tribe what is your group um how should the general public treat someone in the lgbt community <laughs> when as as they would treat anyone. I mean, basically, it's this issue of basic humanity. The uh, we are a culture, at least the you know industrialized Western culture, that claims to respect and honor the individuality and freedom and autonomy and self-determination of every individual. And that is no different for sexuality and gender than it is for ethnicity, for religion, for ideological beliefs. Um, sexuality and gender are fundamental attributes of life. And they, they have far more diverse manifestations than the average person on the street you know, is led to believe. And so when we observe sexual and gender diversity in everyday life, that is another example of the wonderful diversity of the human condition. It's not a disorder. It's not a deficit. It is, you know, the, the wonderfulness of, you know, it's like if you ever have been to one of those fancy rose gardens and they have 18,000 varieties of roses. You might think like, oh my God, I, I used to think that there were only red roses, but there are striped roses and, and brown roses and roses that you can't even imagine. I think that's a useful analogy. Most of us think rose, we think a red rose, but in actuality, that's just what we are, we grow up seeing, our red roses, right? 
And in reality, there is as much diversity in sexual and gender expression as in, you know, as in all the roses on the planet. Um, when it comes to parents, telling a teen that they can't tr transition socially or medically to protect them, is that, in your opinion, right to do? There's, there's no single answer to that because, I mean, generally, the, the one single answer, answer is that parents' first and most important job is to protect, to provide safety for their child physical safety and emotional safety. And when your child comes to you and says, I am in distress, I am hurting, and I need something to help me. Um, transitioning may or may not be the best solution to that particular child, but telling a child that they cannot do something, that certain outcomes are off the table, is a way to undermine safety and a feeling of fullness and authenticity in the child so what i would you know because i know it's become very controversial do you let kids transition do you not and frankly there are very few young adolescents who fully tr uh, transition socially it, it's made out in the media as if like everyone's transitioning that's not quite true there's a lot of mixed identification in childhood and adolescence and a lot of therapists advocate a sort of flexible, gradual, affirmative approach that gives the child time to go through that identity development process and figure out what they want, but to do it in a context in which their emotional safety is paramount and in which parents don't say, you should do this or you should do that, but parents say, how can I keep you safe protect you and nurture you. There are multiple ways for parents to do that. Uh, and so cut and right answers like let them transition or don't oversimplify the issue. The real issue for, for kids is that parental safety and affirmation. If a parent does not accept their child, how much does that weigh on the child? It's probably the most detrimental thing that they can do. Um, there's plenty of research suggesting that parental rejection is one, and not just of LGBT kids, but of all kids. Parental rejection is one of the strongest predictors of depression and suicidality. Our parents are our first and most important social relationships. It is through our connections with our parents that we gain that fundamental sense of safety. And so a parent who does not accept their child, that is a, a deep cut, and that is a deep wound. And I think it's important also to point out that parents can affirm and accept their child even if they don't understand or agree with how the child describes their sexual or gender identity. That there is a way to say, I don't quite get this and I'm working on this and I may not agree with you, but I am 100% behind you. And I think it's a really important message for parents to hear that, that they don't have to accept their child's interpretation of, their, of what their child says about themselves. What they need to do is accept their child, their whole child support their whole child and do everything possible to make that child feel absolutely affirmed. Parents can have as many doubts and disagreements as they want, but their parents, their job is to work that out on their own, but be a source of unconditional love and protection for their child. Do you believe that a child can be taught to be transgender? No, I mean, you know, you can teach a child, you know, how to wear their hair, you can teach a child how to dress, but transgender is an experience, a subjective experience, a subjective identity that comes from inside the person. Um, you can provide individuals with information 
but you cannot create an internal feeling that people don't have in the same way that you can't teach people to be sexually attracted to people that they're not attracted to. You can tell them about gay people, but you can't create desire and you can't create a, a sense of somebody's gender. Those things come from inside. What are the differences of gender dysphoria and body dysphoria? Gender dysphoria typically refers to that psychological sense of gender. Do I feel like I am the gender that people think we are? Body dysmorphia refers more to a sense of, do I see myself, do I have an a, 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 a accurate sense of my own body? Do I see my body the way other people see my body? And so they sometimes go together because in our culture, one of the main ways we differentiate between men and women is through body types and through, you know, judgments about the body. And so someone with gender dysphoria will quickly get the message from society at large that what's going on with your body, right? Do you look the way you ought to look? But, um, but that sort of dysphoria can be very, uh, can be purely psychological or it can be about the physical appearance. So there's a lot of variation. What is one thing you want to change about how society is? I think that society should do more to appreciate the fact that even when they are not actively discriminating against a class of people, whether it's for race or ethnicity or religion or sexuality, even when you're not actively discriminating against a class of people, if your society is marginalizing those individuals, making them feel that they are not part of a community, making them feel that they are lesser than other people, that is just as detrimental to physical and mental health as concrete forms of discrimination, like I'm gonna fire you because you're gay. Uh, there are a lot of individuals who may never experience explicit discrimination, but they receive the message every single day that you are lesser than, that you are not normal, that you are not included. And those messages are incredibly damaging. And we know that they actually have physiological consequences as well as psychological consequences. And if our society prioritized creating a culture of social inclusion and connection, instead of dividing people into groups, you are better, you are worse, that would be, I think, the single biggest benefit that, that you know, we could do. What is one thing you want to change about today's youth? Um, I have been concerned. I, I, I would like youth to um, make sure that they're getting their information from good sources. There's a lot of crap on the internet and um, and there's a lot of good stuff too. I mean, I think one of the greatest things about the internet has been that if you are living in a state that does not have a lot of sex education, you can go online and figure out how to put on a condom. So things like that are great. But that sort of universal information, there's a lot of incorrect information. And I have seen youth feel, be, you know, bullied online and it's like, the stigma that exists outside in, in, in social society, you know, also exists online. And so I wish that youth could um, disconnect a little bit more from some of the toxic, you know, stuff that is online and that gets into people's heads and, and demoralizes them.